Welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to um, thank all of you for joining us for this uh, session on the future of Eurasia. My name is Susan Elliott. I'm the president and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy, which for those of you who don't know me, uh, my organization is a nonprofit which is based in New York City. And we uh, focus on um, looking at issues that affect US foreign policy, but we also do track two negotiations and public programs. We've had a long and very um, fruitful uh, relationship within the Zavi Ganjabi International Center. So I wanna thank Rafshan and all the leadership of the NGIC for inviting me here to, um, to, to um, moderate this panel today. You know, one year ago, I was involved in the, this organization's um, conference on the margins of the UN in New York. So um, it's kind of with sadness that we can't all be together. But on the other hand, I think that uh, our ability to be able to adapt during this global pandemic and to have meetings like this, despite that we can't meet together, I think is extremely important. And it shows the resilience of all of us to make sure that we don't lose our lines of communication during a pandemic. But I guess if you had asked me one year ago when we were all meeting here in New York, you know, would I have envisioned that we wouldn't be able to meet together this year? I would say, no, who could have imagined that we would have a global pandemic? But we have adapted. But I think one of the things that we need to discuss, and this is, I hope, part of our discussion today is, you know, how do we take threats to global security um, seriously, how do we plan for things that maybe we hadn't anticipated? And how do we make policies to make sure that we can deal with um, pandemics in the future and other kinds of threats to um, that look for not only threats to Eurasia, but threats to all of us. And I think, you know, we need to recognize, in, at least in my opinion, as an American, the importance of Eastern Europe and the Balkans. And then looking past that to the Caucasus and Central Asia. Um, you know, we have in the region, when I was looking at the map, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, and haven't spent much of my career working on Central Asia. Um, I know the importance of um, connecting those countries to, um, to Europe. And, you know, the region goes, uh, as I mentioned before, from uh, southeastern Europe, all the way, you know, to me, to the borders uh, with China, uh, Tajikistan and other countries of Central Asia um, border with China. And how do we, um, we look at this area? You know, it's truly a crossroads and it has been for centuries. Um, we know that the Silk Road, the trade routes from Europe to Asia were extremely important, passed through this region. And um, I think it continues today, uh, even though we have a global pandemic to play an important, important role in, in, the, um, in the world. Um, and as we pointed out, um, you know, this hasn't been an easy time, not only for the pandemic, but there have been new um, conflicts arise between Armenia and Azerbaijan. That threatens peace and well-being in the Caucasus, Central Asia, and the Black Sea region. And I think when we look at it, what I'd like to focus on today is, you know, security for Europe and beyond. And how do we address the challenges that we're all facing in this region? Um, and how do we deal with countries like mine, the United States, but also European Union, uh, China, Iran, and Russia, and what roles do they play? And I'd like to even look at what kind of, you know, constructive roles can we play and how do we work together? And not only countries, but also um, how do organizations play a role in this um, region? Um, I've mentioned the European Union, NATO, but I think we also uh, can't forget that we have the Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO, we have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the European Economic Union, Customs Union. So this is truly, in my opinion, an extremely important area of the world, and it's a crossroads. Uh, so I think we all can agree 
Um, and I hope we can explore today, you know, how these shifting realities in this part of the world uh, can be directed towards peace, stability, and constructive uh, activities for the people of the region. And not only, you know, if we look at the pandemic, how that affected health, but how it affected the economies of the region. And if we look at energy, I think we can't think of the region and the countries of the Caspian without thinking of, you know, how the role of energy has changed over the past year or so. But we have many other challenges we face. We had a discussion among leaders of the Western Balkans last week and the challenges of nationalism, corruption, terrorism, and organized crime. They're all things that we have to face together and they're threats to all of us. And if we want peace and economic and uh, political stability, we need to look at these issues. So, um, Rafshan, you've given us a challenging and uh, interesting uh, set of issues uh, to discuss. And so I think I'd like to start with, rather than I'll introduce our panel members as we go along, but I'm gonna start with Ambassador Robert Sakuda, who was US Ambassador to Azerbaijan. So from 2015 to 2018, knows the region quite well and is still uh, actively involved in, in uh, the Caspian Policy Center and the, um, the issue of what we've talked a lot about, about connecting countries on both sides of the Caspian you know, together. So I'll start out with you, Ambassador Sakuda. You can give us your thoughts and then we'll go in alphabetical order and um, I'll give the floor to you, Ambassador Sakuda. Thank you very much, Ambassador Elliot, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I guess I'm a victim of Roman alphabet tyranny that uh, we'll start with the with our in our order. Um, if I could just sort of uh, make a few kickoff remarks sort of building on what Ambassador Elliott just said. Um, and I'm speaking here really as someone who spent 40 years as a US diplomat, um, spent a lot of time as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy, spent a lot of time dealing with energy and economic development. And sort of a sense of how the US and how particularly, if I can say it, this administration is looking at this region. Um, and sort of take that as a, ba as a basis and then maybe look how we can how we can be moving forward and how we could be moving forward in terms of US engagement, whether under a new Trump administration or under a Biden administration. I think first of all, as far as the United States is thinking, one is that um, I think for many Americans, this is a region which is either unknown or known only through conflict. And that unfortunately tends to color a lot of American perceptions and something which we in the State Department and elsewhere, I think have been trying to fight. But I think uh, looking at this area, going from the Black Sea, going from, from the Balkans across, through the Caucasus, through Central Asia, one area of, of importance, one area of engagement, again, as, as Susan noted, is a source for oil and natural gas and is a route for pipelines that can move this energy west and move it in a way that it increases European energy security, energy country, uh, the dependence and flexibility that uh, countries in Western Europe have, and countries in Central and Southeastern Europe have, uh, that it decreases the dependence on Russia and on Iran and on other sources. Again, multiplicity of sources is, is key to energy security and to the country's independence and stability. Second thing, is the growing importance of overland transportation, something which I don't think gets a, as much attention as it probably needs. But when we think about the classic uh, numbers, which I had, where it takes 45 days to get something by ship from Shanghai to Hamburg. You can do it in 10 to 14 days if you go overland through, through Eurasia, through these new roads that are being built. Um, this is also important for connections to India and Pakistan, something which does not get a lot of attention, but the growth of the, PAC, of the Indian economy particularly makes this important. It's something that India is interested in. It is a sort of, put a more of a um, southeast to northwest route. Um, area that's interesting that's becoming important is discussion about new fiber optic links across this region. Again, this allows information to be moved in a way that won't necessarily be interdicted um, by others. Uh, if we think about uh, this part of the world, there's one large sort of uh, region of Central Asia 
Southwest Europe, and then a very narrow band through the Caucasus that goes between Russia and Iran. Um, another point, history has shown the willingness or the tendency towards outside powers to become engaged in conflicts and issues in this region. Um, it's at times been a region, uh, area that's been a sort of the powder cake that has caused war. It has, it has a potential for widening or worsening conflicts. Um, finally, domestic instability or weaknesses in any one country in that region can spread. It can destabilize the whole of the region. Now, one of the things I think from an American point of view or a US government point of view, in looking at this region, particularly I think more towards the Central Asia Caucasus piece, but maybe toward extent also in, in the Balkans, turning to the Black Sea, key things which are concerns. If you look at the US national security strategy, uh, one, one of the top one of the five top concerns is Russia and irredentism or opportunism. Um, second, Iranian ambitions and the sort of a willingness that Iran has shown to meddle in other countries' uh, affairs in playing to uh, boosting its ability for, for various purposes. Third is a sort of uh, the programs of emerging powers or re maybe a better term is re-emerging powers. Turkey and China particularly come to mind in this sense. These are countries which have historic uh, positions, historic weight, and they're coming back on the scene in a new way. And something which I think for those of us who grew up in post-war era, we aren't used to, but something our grandparents and parents, great grandparents are new. Um, the, Ongoing instability in Afghanistan and some other countries on the periphery is also a factor. And finally, uh, again, speaking privately, but I think bluntly, is the factor of America first and America going alone. And this and the effect this is having on the region. Yet in all of this, and this is sort of moving forward and maybe then comes a kickoff for, for some of the, the comments of, of those of you uh, sort of based in the region, from the region. There are signs that the US government despite the sort of America first going alone tendency of uh, signs of US government awareness of the importance of the region and acting on that. One is the establishment of the so-called C5 plus one dialogues. These are discussions among the countries of Central Asia plus Afghanistan. This is a way to increase integration, a way to increase stability, a way to increase economic prosperity in that region. And in an administration which has not necessarily been terribly engaged overseas. Um, this is one of the areas that Secretary Pompeo has paid attention to. He's continued the program started by Secretary Kerry um, and no sort of partisan slamming on this. I think this is a good sign. Um, there's should be probably expanded to sort of bring into the bring in the, the Caucasus because again geography is a tyrant. You can't get to Central Asia except through the Caucasus. So we need to be bringing in Azerbaijan. Uh, Georgia, and I would say probably find a way to bring Armenia into the mix as well. Um, energy diplomacy remains um, a key concern for this administration and I think for, for Europe. Uh, this is a source of energy. I think even though oil prices have dropped, even though there are expectations of falling demand for oil and even natural gas in future years, one of the tendencies is for companies to look for oil and gas where they have found it before. And so when we look at the tremendous resources in Central Asia, the Caspian Basin, this will remain important. Um, there is also a good and very needed focus on connectivity. Um, we've got the Three Seas Initiative, we've got other things which are going on that, that are looking at how this part of the world fits together and how the countries in this part of the world can work more closely together. This is a constructive um, tendency, I think, in our government. And I would also finally just mention one thing and then maybe kick this off to, to others and we can come back to where we, where we should go next. But in an administration which has not put out foreign policy documents, one of the few foreign policy documents it has put out has been a policy towards Central Asia. Again, it's kind of unusual. Uh, it's, it talks a lot about Russia. It talks a lot about China. It uh, in some ways is looking at blunting uh, potential negative influence by those countries in the region. But it also looks at the need to help these countries grow and connect with the rest of the world. Um, if there's one weakness in that policy, it is that it only looks at the five countries, Central Asia plus Afghanistan. But um, 
that connectivity, that looking at that part of the world, I think is important and something which I think can be a constructive basis for further discussion, further effort. So with that, maybe I'll close off and, and uh, turn back over to you, Susan. Well, um, thank you, um, Ambassador Sakuda. And I think you've raised some really good issues about connectivity. You know, when I um, served in the US government, that's one of the things that we looked at is how can we connect not only the countries of Central Asia to themselves, but across the Caspian and look toward Europe, um, as well as realizing the influences that, um, that come from China and to the East. But also, um, I think the connectivity when you talked about, you know, how do we connect and look to South Asia? and going through Afghanistan to Pakistan and India, which could be a big market for um, these countries, not only for energy, but for other things. But I, other, I, I also like that you brought up about um, the connectivity in terms of the internet and uh, fiber optics, because I think one of the issues, at least for countries of Central Asia, is this connectivity. The poorer countries, especially I was US ambassador to Tajikistan, um, very few uh, homes and households have connection you know, to the internet. And that's one thing that we did. And when we look at people connect by cell phone and then the influence that China's having in terms of the, uh, the market with Huawei and others, I think this is a way that in the times of pandemic that we have to think about, we can connect because as I mentioned at the beginning, if we all didn't have great connection to the internet, we wouldn't be able to have these great dialogues today. And in my organization, you know, back in March, I wondered how can we uh, conduct track two discussions if we can't meet face to face? And we've really uh, been able to adapt, but without this um, ability to connect to the internet, which many, many um, less developed countries don't have, uh, I think that's an issue that we need to, to look at. And I want to move on now to uh, Mr. Husseinov, um, who's a senior advisor and senator, Center for Analysis in International Relations uh, in Azerbaijan. Um, he's written a book about uh, geopolitical rivalries in the common neighborhood. And uh, I think um, he really can give us kind of a good sense of uh, where, where we are in the region. And, um, you know, this is always at least an issue to me. Do countries in this area look to the east, look to the west, look to the north, look to the south, and how do we um, how do we um, square that circle? So anyway, I'll turn it over uh, to you, Basayev. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Elliot. Uh, first, I would like to say that this is a great honor for me to address this distinguished panel, and it's a bit hard also for me uh, to speak in front of so many. Uh, distinguished people. I am the one with the least experience in international affairs amongst you, and uh, that's why thank you very much for having me. Uh, as Ambassador Elliot previously mentioned, um, in recent months, uh, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan has escalated, and in July this year, we had a very intense confrontation, which um, caused the deaths of up to uh, 20 military servicemen on both sides. And uh, in, in recent weeks, the escalations, the tensions remain strained. And in fact, uh, over the last uh, few days, uh, we have uh, a new round of escalation, which many local and international observers have borne that it might lead to a full-scale war in the region. So that's why uh, I will focus on the Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict, recent developments, and what does it mean for the future of Eurasia in general. Uh, as you probably know, on a number of occasions this year, Azerbaijan's President Ilham Aliyev uh, declared that negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan, mediated by the Minsk Group of the OSC, are pointless adding that Azerbaijan will not participate in this process for the sake of negotiations. The border clashes between the two countries in July this year gave more reasons to President Aliyev to reiterate this statement, as attacking Azerbaijan's military units on the state border uh, in a location far from the Nagorno-Karabakh region 
and near the main energy and transportation routes of Azerbaijan, the routes which connect Azerbaijan with Turkey and Europe. So uh, by this attack, Armenia has indicated its complete disinterest for a breakthrough in the conflict, uh, leave alone its, uh, its resolution. So although the clashes calmed down quickly in July, but as I said previously, tensions remain strained between the two countries. And that's why an escalation is expected again uh, between the sides. So importantly, the situation in the country following the July clashes are remarkably different from the one we had before the clashes. Uh, the main novelty uh, is, is regarding the role of external players in this process. Uh, before the July clashes, Russia was, Russia was appearing to play a mediating role and was avoiding from openly siding with Armenia or Azerbaijan. Uh, I have to mention that Russia is uh, one of the co-chairs of uh, Minsk Group, uh, along with the United States and France. So Russia, uh, before these clashes, was totally uh, playing an, a neutral mediating role. But after the clashes, we started to see Russia that ships tons of arms to Armenia through complex transportation routes and denying this in response uh, to harsh criticism of the, of the Azerbaijani government. So July clashes also brought about a difference into Turkey's policies concerning the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. Uh, having realized Armenia's intention to block the energy and transportation routes connecting Azerbaijan and Turkey against the backdrop of increasingly more aggressive statements of the Armenian government, Ankara started to take a stronger position beside Azerbaijan. Thus, on the one hand, we see that Armenia and Azerbaijan remain at loggerheads on critical issues, and no positive breakthrough is on the horizon in the negotiations at all. On the other hand, we see Russia apparently drifting away from its role of neutral mediator, and Turkey investing more military and political role in the process. Uh, I, I have to say that this all uh, hardly promised anything positive for the region. Quite contrary, we see more provocative moves from the Armenian side that further deteriorate the situation and push it towards the edge of a full-scale war. Uh, I, I, I want to mention particularly three provocations that uh, caused outrage in Azerbaijan. First, was the uh, news about the resettlement of Lebanon's Armenians in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan uh, in the aftermath of Beirut explosion in early August, uh, creating a new, uh, attempting to create a new, uh, to create a new demographic situation in the occupied territories of Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia violates international law. It's criticized by uh, by Azerbaijan side as an attempt to create a fait accompli for future negotiations. Secondly. It was reported that the occupational regime in Nagorno-Karabakh is planning to move its capital from Khankandi or Stepanakert, as Armenians call it, to Sha, a city of extreme historical and moral importance for Azerbaijan. And finally, the third provocation that I uh, want to mention is uh, about the transfer of PKK Kurdish terrorist groups from Syria to Armenia. It was reported by an uh, Egyptian, uh, Egyptian um, media portal, but also was previously reported by Azerbaijan media agencies that uh, there is a plan, there is a fact of, uh, of the transfer of PKK Kurdish groups uh, to Armenia in order to fight against Azerbaijan. So these are all uh, extremely worrying developments and make it uh, very, make it very important for the international community to react uh, and prevent the escalation of the conflict. As the failure of negotiations and the escalation of the conflict in the war will not only damage the international intra-regional situation in the, in the, in the South Caucasus, uh, but also will negatively impact, uh, impact the future of Eurasia in general. 
by this, I would like to conclude my uh, speech and I, I will be happy to uh, join the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Thank you for that <clears throat> very um, detailed and updated uh, account of what's going on today um, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. I think that um, as someone, uh, although I'm an American, but as someone who's focused on that region um, uh, for most of my career, and you know, it's not just in the conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh, but the the conflict along the border, I think, is something that um, I hope perhaps that we can discuss and it affects all of us because Ambassador Sakuda brought up the importance of connectivity, especially land and energy routes. And if there's conflict, um, it makes it difficult um, to, that's a very important uh, transit route and it makes it very difficult, I think, for, um, for all of us to be able to discuss how can we connect, whether it's overland or whether it's um, the energy, um, if there's conflict going on. And you mentioned the Minsk group. I think this is um, early in my career. I was involved back in the 1990s after the breakup of the Soviet Union of being involved from the US side. I work for the, um, the US co-chair. I know Ambassador Sakuda has been very interested in this, something that we talked about, and I guess as a former diplomat, I'd like to um, see if um, if this is something that we can discuss, um, and maybe that's a, a conversation we can have as we go on and hear from our other colleagues about how um, we can play a constructive role. You've mentioned Turkey, you've mentioned Russia, but you know how can the countries of the region? play an important role in keeping the tensions down because I think none of us want to see an escalation of the conflict between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. So I want to move on to, um, to President Ivanic, um, who was president of Bosnia from 2014-2018, who's been a very, uh, very active member of NGIC and I think um, uh, very important in helping us to discuss differences in the importance of the region from, we've talked about sort of the other side of the Black Sea and the Caspian, but what's your view uh, from, you know, Bosnia and Herzegovina? So I'll turn it over to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ambassador Elliott, and uh, it's my pleasure to be today uh, in this uh, uh, let's say very interesting uh, event, and uh, I will have a few few thoughts. First, a little bit general about the Euro Asia, maybe the most significant part of the world, because majority of the world population is placed there. So a lot of potentials for the Euro Asia. We have the most developed economy, like a European Union, in that part of the world, and we have also emerging economies like China, like India. And I think that uh, essentially this part can be really the most significant part of the, of the world global economy. On the other hand, this is also area where you have the most difficult conflicts. Just to mention Afghanistan, Syria, to mention Kavkaz, to mention the current situation in Ukraine, to mention Middle East, Palestine, and uh, Israel. So everywhere, some sort of the very significant and which is even more important, long lasting conflicts. And without solving these conflicts, I don't see the stable future of the Euro-Asia in decades to come. So somehow the main priority is to overcome these uh, conflicts and to try to find a solution. Is it realistical? Very difficult to say at this point, because I think that there is a very significant difference, uh, uh, something which I consider very significant, the way how the societies are organized. You have let's say European approach where the institutions are more important than anything else, 
But then you have, let's say, mainly Asia approach where the leader is more important and where the institutions are not significant. I really believe that this difference is something which is essential and which can and did already divide in the past uh, Euro-Asia in two almost conflicted parts. Is it difficult that these two different ways of organizing society can find a common approach? For me, it looks like uh, impossible at these days in short term, but in long term, I really believe that this is necessary. Necessary because I think that at some point there is a need to have some sort of the meeting. At the beginning, maybe be between the European Union and the Russia. Maybe also to have all of them definitely to include in a longer period countries like India, even Iran, and even Turkey. I think that some sort of the channel where these key countries can sit together and try taking into account all differences to find some sort of the mutual agreement, I think that we will live in the conflicts in the future. And which is not good. It's not good for the for the whole world, it's not good for the Euro Asia. And I think that the other countries they have to make a pressure on these players uh, to sit together and to try to find a common, common solution. Because majority of the small conflict, let's say small, significant, big, but let's say uh, limited on some area, can be overcome only under one condition, that the big players have more or less the same approach. As long as the big players have a different view on concrete country, there is no way to find uh, a, a, a common agreement. This is something which was learned in Bosnia. Really successfully compared the difficulties with Bosnia. It was possible to, to solve that conflict only because Russia, European Union, uh, United States, Turkey, Serbia and Croatia were on the same side. That was preconditioned to, to make some sort of the stability within the Bosnia. And this is advice which can be applied all over the world and especially in this in these conflicts I, which I already mentioned. Speaking about the region, uh, region is in a relatively, let's say, there are some positive, but also some negative elements in, in the region. Uh, when I spoke about the different ways of organization of the society, that can be applied also in the Western Balkans, because we are the part of the European Union, of the Europe, especially of the Europe. And because of that, we have to emphasize institutions more than leaders. But unfortunately, if you see the, the region, the leaders are more important than institutions. Uh, almost every leader in the Western Balkan is trying to be some sort of the Tsar, some sort of the emperors, that everything depends on them. And this is a really, really, really big, big, uh, some sort of the internal conflict within the region. If we want to be part of Europe, we have to emphasize institutions. But unfortunately, the political culture the society is still oriented on the personality. And uh, personalities are very often, uh, they behave in a way that they are more important than institutions. And that is essential, essential problem of, of, of this region. Additionally to that, I think that European Union, faced with internal challenges, faced with a pandemic also, doesn't have a real new enthusiastic approach about the region. Europe is typically doing that in a routine way, which means some sort of the conditions which are not too significant. European Union is definitely not enough visible in the region. And because of that, we have increasing role of the Russia, 
and increasing especially economic role of China, because this is now some sort of the empty space for them, uh, which if everything can be negotiated in some sort of the acceptable framework, cannot be so bad. But there is a need and there is a pressure, especially on the European Union, to be more active and not to stick only with the, I would say, with the formal uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, conditions, to bring some new fresh air in the region, to support the, the real development, to support the real public media. Uh, if you see the Western Balkans, you will see that uh, media is basically a tool of the current leaderships in the region. Opposition doesn't have a normal access in any of the countries in the Western Balkan. It's just a tool where you can see just uh, uh, leading parties. Uh, and there was no real statement by the EU because this is one of the basic uh, uh, values for which European Union is. But in the region, they don't care about that. Uh, there is a need, and you mentioned that, uh, Ambassador Elliot, uh, to completely change uh, the society, to emphasize the role of institutions, the, ro the rule of law, and to fight against corruption. We don't have concrete elements uh, and concrete evidences that the European Union is trying to do something. They put that like a condition, but there is no real pressure, activity, condition for the economic and financial support for the leaders in the in the region to do that and to start to fight against the corruption which is very significant and uh, i i really expect that that like precondition to have the region more stable and more developing in a in a democratic in a democratic way hope that this will be the case because without that if the situation with the pandemic will continue, I expect a huge negative influence on economy, especially. And without having at least some sort of the of the growth, I think that internal difficulties within the region will be even more difficult, and that nationalism will be even stronger than than before, which is then not very good for the region. So, for the uh, Western Balkan, the key is more active role of European Union. They cannot just cry of, and criticizing the role of the Russia and the China. They're doing their job there. And European Union has to do its job also in the region. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I think you, um, I'm going to say, unfortunately, have really laid out the problems that we, you know, that we face. And this, um, I think your, um, your outlining of you know personalities versus institutions is an extremely you know important one and that institutions uh, like the european union um are very important and i think that you i'll use a, a an american term you know need to put their money where their mouth is by what do i mean by that is that you know you can tell people you need to fight corruption you need to solve these problems but if you don't help to create the communities and the atmosphere to do that uh then it's extremely difficult i think for for countries who have been in conflict to um to uh, meet the i'll call them the bureaucratic standards to be able to uh, join the organization but one just question I may come back to you on before we move on, but, you know, you mentioned that, you know, the big players need to get all on the same page, but I guess on, in my mind, that probably is one of the challenges that, that um, the countries of the region face is that the big players, whether it's the U.S., European Union, Russia, uh, China, are not on the same page, and, um, and it makes it very difficult for the smaller players to be able to uh, come to some uh, kind of decision on what they need to do. And I'm just wondering, do you envision that there could be any meeting of the minds of the bigger uh, players, given the situation between the US, Russia, and China, um, European Union in the, in the short term? 
Unfortunately, in the short term, I don't see that uh, like a chance to make something uh, over the night, let's say so. Uh, I think that the main problem, uh, especially if to, to have, let's say, European Union and Russia together, is the Ukraine situation in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, my perception is that Russia has a feeling that West is going, NATO especially, is going too far toward their borders, and there is a fear of them. Is it logical? I don't know. It's so maybe on the on the on the on the more experienced people to 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 judge that. On the other hand, a fear is the reason why NATO has uh, troops in the Baltic countries, in the Poland, which is relatively close there. So a fear, prejudice about each other, prejudice about what are the next steps is something which is the precondition. Without solving a situation in Ukraine, I don't think that in short term is logical to expect the big players, especially speaking now about Eurasia, EU and Russia, to sit together. Very, very, it looks like unrealistic, but uh, trying to be a positive. I think that we all have to make the pressure in that direction and not to find excuse not to having discussions uh, about that. They can start with maybe smaller things, with some things which are not so difficult, like but there is a need to have more trust. Without the trust, they will be isolated from each other, and they will continue to try to find the local players who will be the tools for them to fight far from them. In the region, in the Western Balkan, every side will try to find its own player, and then we will continue to live in a conflict, which is uh, very, very, very difficult. And coming back to the leaders in the region, they like that. Speaking about the leaders in the Western Balkans, all of them would like to be like Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, having everything under control. Uh, and if you don't have institutions which can limit them, you will have so artificial situation of the leaders who are not so significant, not so important, but behaving like a Putin. And that can uh, create a lot of difficulties a lot of difficulties in the region. Well, I would um, definitely agree with you. And one of the things I think has been a missed opportunity in speaking as an American is we've had the opportunity as smaller, larger countries to work together to, um, to try to fight the pandemic. And it hasn't seemed that that common threat has brought any of us together. So, um, why don't we now move on? I'd like to move to uh, President Yasipovic. Um, President Yasipovic, thank you again for um, you. for joining us today. And he was the president of um, of Croatia from 2010 to 2015. And um, we very much would like to hear um, your perspective because I think countries of of uh, former Yugoslavia um, really have. Uh, a good perspective on how um, how do you deal with a conflict, and I do think that something that President Ivanic said about you know how did you achieve peace, and it was because the bigger countries uh, all got together and agreed that we need you know to help help you. So anyway, uh, I give the floor to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to participate. Sorry for being late. I had some obligations at university. Uh, so uh, I'll try to answer your question. Uh, firstly, uh, it was very interesting to listen to President Ivanic. Uh, he mentioned differences in Asia and Europe uh, concerning social structures. I will like to add culture, religion, uh, society in general. And that's uh, true. But also I would like to mention that some characteristics, especially political characteristics on the East, that's uh, um, leading role of individuals and uh, the West in Europe, it's uh, uh, importance of institutions are not forever. Now we are witnessing that in Europe, uh, in some states, uh, let's say Hungary, why not? Or some other countries, 
we have a very visible switch to the model when the person leadership is uh, uh, decisive, decisive uh, in political life. Uh, nevertheless, uh, of the role of institutions. Uh, there is no guarantees that this trend, I will not uh, judge it whether it's good or not, will not be spread to some other countries as well. Uh, let's see. In principle, uh, there is assumption in Europe, in the European Union especially, that uh, care about role of institution and their importance is key issue for democracy, at least uh, uh, for the type of democracy we have in European Union. Uh, definitely, when judging the future of Eurasia, we have to have in mind this uh, big political, cultural, and social differences uh, of uh, many countries, even uh, in frames of some circles of countries that we consider together, like European Union or Western Balkans or uh, uh, Caucasus region and so on. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to stress again after so many of our meetings that I'm worried about situation, uh, not only uh, in my region, that's uh, region of former Yugoslavia, Western Balkans and uh, part of European Union, but also I'm worried about the big picture that now boring uh, some uh, uh, that now is pressuring on the peace in the world, uh, that especially there is uh, issue between Israel and some neighbors, it's uh, Syria, uh, uh, issue between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, and uh, what's uh, dominant global characteristic is that uh, multilateralism is somehow neglected, and uh, the role of international law is diminished as well. I think that the uh, issue of nagorno karabakh uh, shows very well how uh, the importance uh, of uh, international law is uh, neglected because uh, definitely if uh, all states obey, obey international law, the situation will be resolved many years ago, unfortunately. Uh, it's not the case, uh, and uh, the legitimate interest of Azerbaijan to keep uh, territorial integrity is not uh, now on the scene because uh, international law is not uh, obeyed by some countries. Uh, definitely, uh, the big powers has important role, and they are. Um, decisive in many cases, but I always went to my thesis that engagement of big powers are, is not enough. It's not enough because uh, we have many cases in the history and in our neighborhood uh, in which uh, the, the uh, good will of, of big powers, even their consensus, was not enough to resolve internal problems or regional problems as well. Now, in Western Balkans and the region, uh, we do not have military conflict. It's very good, uh, and uh, we can be proud on it. But in the other case, uh, uh, our problem here in the region is that uh, political elites are not uh, strong enough or not, not uh, devoted to the idea of the peace, uh, to not enough to, to reach uh, agreement that will ensure uh, everlasting peace in the region. Um, that's visible between different different uh, countries, uh, but also in frames of some countries, including, unfortunately, my one of my favorite countries. My uh, you can easily say some my, uh, another homeland, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which I like very much. But unfortunately, that country political elites for now decades are not capable to find. Mm -hmm. Uh, to find um, a sustainable solution for their internal relations, of course, incorporated in global relations, with role of big powers, with role of neighbors, yeah. everything is clear. But unfortunately, uh, the essence is internal, internal uh, agreement between main political forces uh, in the country. That's also the case with some other countries and uh, 
political conflicts or misunderstandings in the region as well. So uh, I would like to stress that uh, political elites in all countries in the region, in not only in Western Balkans or in a uh, region that we call former Yugoslavia, but in other countries as well, uh, should be uh, more uh, con uh, more concentrate how to find the peace solution or permanent peace solution by themselves. If they are not willing to find a compromise, unfortunately, the word compromise is not used frequently uh, in many regions, including Western Balkans, there will be no everlasting peace in the region. And we can see it in many, many uh, situations all around the globe, including Eurasian, uh, big region. Uh, definitely, uh, there are uh, too high expectations uh, from politicians, from general public, about famous consensus of big powers. I think it's far to be enough for the peace and for consensus. Uh, for compromise, yes, big powers can uh, do many useful things. Definitely, they can spoil as well, as well many situations. But without internal or, or regional consensus, there is no everlasting uh, peace. Dayton Agreement, uh, Dayton Agreement was mentioned here as um, some mode of consensus of big powers, neighboring countries. Uh, uh, all state in, states, including in the Balkan War. Uh, but uh, I have to stress that it's not ordinary situation. It's completely different when you have a political situation where countries are exhausted by the war and definitely conscience that, uh, with conscience that uh, the, the, the continuation of the war can imperil uh, political leaders themselves, uh, countries themselves, region itself as well. Uh, it's much different than the uh, situation we have today. It's uh, now, fortunately, the period when we have peace among countries. And um, this threat of, uh, of political threat for political elites, for countries, is not so high to impose pressure on them to make some kind of compromise Dayton Agreement is definitely not perfect, but some kind of compromise that uh, led to, to the end of the war. So uh, it's very important, definitely. It's very important. But uh, I'm not sure that it's, it can be repeated in this period of our history uh, on Balkans or some other, other uh, countries here. Uh, mm, what to do? Uh, definitely, uh, the solution is not uh, very near, unfortunately. I uh, did many initiatives, participated in many activities, how to reach uh, everlasting peace in the region. Uh, but always, uh, the, the interest, uh, I would like selfish interest of political elites prevail over idea of peace, in spite of that uh, everyone who is really thinking long-term thinking, who has long-term thinking, must conclude that for the country, uh, compromise peace is much better solution than instability and possible possible war. Uh, there are some political leaders that are gambling with the idea of the war, promoting the dissolution of countries, joint went to the other countries, or having active political activities, trying to influence the, the political scene of other countries. And we are witnessing it every day. Uh, I did quite a lot of uh, efforts to cancel appropriate participation of Croatia in some events in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and I consider it as one of my uh, successes during my main day. Um, uh, my advice, uh, let's try to think uh, long-term future of our countries. Probably it's much easier uh, to, to give this advice from a side and not uh, anymore involved in high politics uh, than being prime minister, president or, or minister uh, or, or 
always under pressure of public opinion about different political uh, forces in the country, out of the country, and definitely it's not easy. Uh, the leaders should be uh, very honest and very strong personalities to switch from uh, nationalism now governing almost all countries in the region. Unfortunately, I think that nationalism is uh, the worst thing we have, Co nationalism and corruption as well. Corruption is very high in the region. So um, uh, when we think about this part of Eurasian uh, uh, region, that means Western Balkans, I think that really a European future is something that can uh, make uh, everlasting peace as uh, our uh, good expectation, reasonable good expectation, uh, but it's not easy. It's a long-term project. Unfortunately, there are uh, forces in respected countries, candidates, uh, obstructing the process or with completely wrong idea that uh, joining EU is favored to European Union. It's not. It's not. It's favored to their countries. And if uh, someone thinks that they are going to put some pressure on European Union to accept any country without fulfilling strong requirements, he's wrong. He or she is wrong. And uh, to, to, to make some of these Western Balkan countries to wait for European membership for another 20 or 30 years is disaster. It's disaster not only uh, for uh, stability and peace, uh, but also uh, for economy of those countries. Uh, definitely, Euro European Union is not in the most fortunate period of uh, its life. Uh, but it's still the most successful uh, European, not only European, but I would like to say even the world uh, uh, mode of cooperation of different countries. And for uh, this region, for Europe, European Union is the only way how to be uh, in positive and successful compete with other powers, with uh, Russia, with the United States, with China, with some other big countries, uh, not only uh, in economical, but also in political matters. So uh, my, my main message is, let's try to think long term. Let's try to overcome our personal interest. Uh, and uh, let's uh, analyze what really uh, countries in the region can benefit from EU membership in economical and political uh, political matters. Uh, so I'm very in favor of, uh, of uh, European future of all uh, countries in the region. Um, I hope Croatia will continue to support all our uh, uh, neighbors, not only na immediate neighbors, but neighbors from the region in their European ambition. But they must be aware that just them can make their countries uh, EU members, not uh, friends from outside, not big powers, but uh, willing to fight corruption, willing to fight uh, to fight um, uh, nationalism, uh, extreme nationalism, and of course to understand that it's much better to have a good neighbor than the highest wall. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. President, I think you brought up a very important point, and that is that you know change has to come from within. And no matter uh, what the big powers think, if the people of the country uh, are not willing to do what they need to do to make the changes, then I think um, it's very difficult for any organization or other country to legislate the, the kinds of changes that need to be made. And I think you make a very important point, I guess this is my personal opinion, is that bringing countries of Southeast Europe, the Western Balkans into the European Union, um, make the European Union stronger. And then I think it also helps the European Union to be able to um, project and look again to the countries of Central Asia and the Caspian region to make the, the region uh, stronger. Um, but I do think you're absolutely right that even on the Dayton Accord, um, the US and other countries uh, put 
uh, your um, the countries of former Yugoslavia together, but it was the actual people and leaders who made the decision that they wanted no more conflict and they wanted um, peace. So um, I'd like to move now to um, President uh, Plevnil, um, I'm going to say it correctly, Plevniliev who was president of Bulgaria from 2012 to 2017. And for me, Mr. President, you know, Bulgaria is a really, um, your perspective I think is extremely important because being a former a country of former um, Warsaw Pact, but now member of NATO, member of European Union, you know, what are your thoughts on how uh, Europe and uh, Asia and the countries together can work to resolve some of these um, I'm going to say phenomenal or very difficult issues that we're all facing. So I give the floor to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, uh, I'd love to talk about today's topic, Eurasia. Even I don't like the word very much, especially when the president of Russia was bringing his idea about Eurasian Union from Vladivostok to Berlin. Uh, I really hated that idea. But uh, yes, uh, Europe and Asia coming together, uh, very much interlinked, uh, very much interdependent. And uh, there is a logic of what's going on. There are trends that clearly to be seen. Uh, and uh, of course, let's look first of all of the big picture. And uh, as we see today, a lot of analysts, a lot of political leaders are talking about Cold War between the United States and China or a new technological Cold War or talking about the Cold War between Russia and the United States. Um, I don't agree with this judgment on a, on a greater level, on the big picture, what's going on is not a replica of where we were. We're not just in a replica of a new or a second Cold War. We are in a new phase of development. I was very proud in 2015 being invited by the Munich Security Conference on the President's panel right after the Russian prime minister was talking and he said, and now the United States launched a second cold war against Russia. No, I totally disagree. No, it's not the case where we are, but yes, we're not in a cold war, but I believe we are in a new phase of development, which I call cold peace. It's still peace because nobody wants to have a war, uh, but especially a global war, but it is a cold peace because we see the methods from the Cold War back in time, confrontation, propaganda wars, hybrid wars, frozen conflicts, and trying to destabilize your, let's say not enemy, but an opponent in an any possible way. And uh, if you look at what's going on with the frozen conflicts, it's very easy to understand that when you look from um, the whole Black Sea region, from Ukraine uh, to Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and many other countries, Russia is using the, uh, the uh, methods uh, of uh, frozen conflicts in their, own, uh, in their own way in order to keep the countries in the region dependent because the frozen conflict is a very, I would repeat again, cheap and efficient instrument of keeping somebody dependent. So we are in a new phase of development. To me, that's a transition from one global order we are about to lose to another global order we're still not creating. And as any other transition period in time of history, it's gonna be very windy, a lot of hurricanes, a lot of crises, record number of conflicts, refugees, terrorist attacks. And it is a transformation uh, period. Global power is changing, geopolitics is changing, and you can feel it, you can sense it, especially in Eurasia, very, very, very strongly. What's going on in the region, first of all, um, is that countries understand that. Uh, they understand we are in an unpredictable situation. Who would predict five years ago that the United Kingdom that built the biggest empire by territory in the world is going to isolate itself in its own island? Who would predict that uh, the president of the United States would uh, point at Mercedes-Benz as his biggest enemy and at the dictator of North Korea as his one of his best friends? Uh, who would predict just uh, a couple of years ago that uh, Russia would play a dominant military role uh, dominating the, the airspace in Syria and, and bombing with, uh, with rockets, uh, uh, military and civil um, uh, targets in the Middle East. But it is what it is. So we are moving to a new multipolar world. It's obvious to me, uh, Russia, United States, of course, as a global dominating power, but also 
China are bringing their ambitions to the table. We hope, but the European Union is still not there to be a global player. And we probably gonna see India uh, also, because if you look very carefully now between India and China, you see a lot of differences on their approach in Asia. And uh, that could tell you that also India is on a very ambitious plan to play their own game. So a lot of global powers, a lot of regional powers. And as we say in my country, the cake is gonna be cut new and everybody's positioning itself to do that. What are the countries in the region doing? Especially to understand Southeast Europe is very easy because you can see the two groups, those who are in the European Union and those who would like to be in the European Union. And of course, NATO. Um, countries like Bulgaria, but also Romania, Croatia, Greece, are taking very important decisions today, buying F-16s, Bulgaria is gonna buy a new American nuclear powered reactor. Uh, Bulgaria, uh, Romania is uh, uh, hosting uh, one of the biggest new American uh, military bases. Uh, the, the, the United States let uh, uh, shield on Europe uh, uh, was uh, actually first act in the basis of Devesel, which is in Romania. So Romania, Bulgaria, um, Poland, are trying to be as active as possible, as much as possible, into showing their belonging to uh, the Western world and being very active members of NATO and uh, the European Union. Especially if you look also at those countries, again, Slovenia, Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania, the, they benefited heavily from their uh, membership in the European Union, just to mention that, for example, our GDP tripled in the last 20 years, um, and also the exports of Bulgaria. If you look at 10 years time, 10 years ago, we had 20 billion, today we have 60 billion, so exports tripled in 10 years. But 10 years ago, the exports of Bulgaria were towards more like Russia, Turkey, such kind of countries. Today, 90% of our exports go in the very heart of Europe, which is Germany, Austria, Italy, and so on and so on. So the European Union, the common market is working, is changing the countries and is shifting power. So, but the other countries that are in the Western Balkans, they want to be members of the European Union, they will be helped, they deserve, because the Balkan is a beautiful and very important part of Europe, geostrategically, and this has to do. But as you see that things are in a transitional way, uh, a lot of unpredictability, a lot of um, record number of conflicts, problems to be solved all over the place, including the United States, including UK, including Europe, including countries like China, Russia, and the others. So there is no hope for quick progress. Uh, and that is why uh, focusing, for example, on the frozen conflicts all over the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea, there is no, unfortunately, uh, horizon for a solution because how could be possible that country like Russia, which is a, a member of the U United Nations Security Council, is violating the rules of international order in an arrogant way, and uh, who cares about that? If you look at the most important institution probably we have in the world, which is the United Nations, in the United Nations Security Council, it is totally blocked today. Doesn't work. Doesn't work at all. So. On a global level, there is no positive uh, message uh, uh, to small countries. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to, to balance between the interests of different, for example, for Bosnia is not easy because they have to balance, first of all, European Union, United States, but also Turkey, Russia, which is very heavy. They're trying to, uh, through the so-called uh, Republic of Srpska in the Bosnia-Herzegovina, threatening, even with the war, this beautiful, and. You know, and a wonderful country, which could be a very, very negative uh, uh, scenario, but it's possible. It's possible playing with different religions uh, in, a, in a way. I would uh, again mention that uh, Chancellor Merkel was calling me and was telling me, Mr. President, you know, uh, the Russian president called me. He said, Madam President, you know who is in my office? And she said, I don't know. Uh, you're in Moscow. I'm in Berlin. He said, well, uh, well, the patriarch of Syria is in my office. And you know what? I have to defend Eastern Orthodox religions, wherever they are in the world. That's why I'm in Syria. Well, uh, I have to say that's very dangerous. Uh, we're moving to Huntington even, uh, because I am an Eastern Orthodox too, but I don't want Putin to defend me because Bulgaria is a great a member of the European Union and NATO, and we are gonna do that also for the future. So different 
unpredictable times, no good news, international institutions are weakened, international uh, rule of law is questioned. Uh, we see not uh, a move towards support of rules and institutions, but we see interests that play a very important role. Principles are not important today, but uh, the interest of one or another. As long as we don't have a big shift, and it depends on all of us, it's educational problem. If we continue electing strong leaders like uh, the Trumps and Bolsonaros and Erdogans and the others that are using our democracies to emptying them out of content in one or the other way, because those leaders are weakening, they're not building up institutions, rules and order. Uh, I don't think that uh, we are uh, having a positive scenario. The positive scenario will come with new leaders that come together in an attempt at the United Nations and the United Nations Security Council to say, okay, it's a new multipolar world. We have different global and regional powers, but whoever, whatever, the European Union is not gonna push its own agenda in the Middle East because the Arab Spring was a total disaster. We need to understand and respect the differences, but we need to build up institutions and rules for the 21st century, for the new world to come. I don't see that happening today with the leaders we have. So we need patience and a bit more time. Thank you. Well, I think you have reiterated what uh, President uh, Ivanic uh, said about the difference between building up institutions and you know building up leaders. But one question I would just go back to you before we go to President Tajic is, um, so you mentioned about Russia. Is there any way that we can engage, uh, having served twice and worked at the US Embassy in Moscow, I'd like to see a way where um, we could somehow engage in um, Russia with with Russia. Obviously, we don't have to agree, but so that there isn't this tension that especially countries like yours feel. Um, and when uh, countries join NATO, then I think that's more of a threat and you know to Russia. But any thoughts that you have on how um, countries like U.S. European Union, you know, could engage with Russia to and China as well, instead of having uh, tension in our uh, relationships, but to work together uh, for the interests of all in the region. I, I think this may be too much of a lofty diplomatic goal, but I think <laughs> because you're kind of on the cusp of all of these issues. Uh, well, Napoleon was saying, if you don't have a cause, you need a war. And uh, let's uh, think a bit about what's the cause of the, of the Russian president, of, of a wise president. Uh, if I would say the cause of a wise president is to educate, make people more free, more prosperous, build up rules, build up institutions. But this is not happening in the United States, uh, in uh, Russia at all. So the point is that uh, the president Putin uh, uh, doesn't have a cause and because, and he knows that. Because of that, he needs a war. But because war is very difficult uh, to maintain, he needs conflicts. And actually the European Union is a very convenient, I repeat, convenient opponent to be projected as an enemy to President Putin just for his own purposes because he doesn't have a cause. He is not making Russians more prosperous, more free, the Russians are living a bad life, the Russians are not free, and it's not a society that the others take as an example for something. Putin also burning a lot of cash, so we're coming to a moment where Russia actually doesn't have also money. Uh, and uh, just look at, for example, Serbia and Bulgaria. The Bulgaria took from the European Union in the last uh, 14 years uh, 26 billion euros on, on, on help, uh, Serbia took from Russia 700 million. Just to see uh, how huge is the difference between what the European Union can do and what Russia can do in the region. So to answer your question very clearly, on the short term, uh, there is no good news because uh, President Putin is not going to change his opinion and, and his uh, role of what he is doing. Um, and he's not focusing on solving internal issues for Russia, uh, but he's more projecting conflict after conflict, frozen conflict after frozen conflict, by telling all the others, listen, you need to respect my will. I had a meeting with President Putin, which was a very simple like that. He was telling me, listen, Mr. President, 
you think Russia's going to do big things in Bulgaria? No, we're not interested. Uh, Bulgaria and Romania went into European Union and NATO, that's gone. But if Ukraine, if Georgia, if countries in my proximity are going to be pushed into the uh, European Union and NATO, then we have a big problem. Uh, and also he was telling me that actually he doesn't have any big ambitions for the countries that are already in the Union and NATO, but he's going to be very tough on those who might potentially follow. And we see what's going on. The President Putin was about to organize uh, a coup d'etat in uh, Montenegro by, uh, by uh, bringing the legitimate government together just because they decided to go quickly into a NATO membership. He can do those things in the region because all those networks of communist uh, secret services, oligarchs, uh, mafiosos and corruption guys are, <coughs> let's say Putin is the king of corruption. He knows how to use those networks in his own way. So to make a long story short, it depends as the president Ivanich was saying in the internal strength of society, institutions, media, to fight for better institutions, better societies. That is not the game of uh, President Putin at all. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, President. And um, I'm going to turn now to one of the co-chairs of the Nizavi Ganjavi um, um, International Center. And uh, President uh, Tajic, I first of all want to thank you for your leadership um, in helping us to put this, not only this panel together today, but being so actively involved in the NGIC. And uh, I think that um, it's extremely important to hear your points of view. And um, as I said at the beginning, um, Ambassador Sakuda had the unfortunate um, having to go first because his name, his uh, surname begins with C. Yours was the last in the alphabet, uh, Tajic. So we're saving, um, I want to say we're saving the best for last, but um, I will say that we're saving the best for last. Everyone has given us their point of view, but we're very much looking forward to hearing from you as we wrap up uh, our discussion. So Mr. President, and all of, as all of you know, um, Mr. President was president of Serbia, but he also had many important roles in the government of Serbia. And we very much are looking forward to hearing um, your thoughts on all these complex issues that we brought up today. So Mr. President, over to you. Thank you, Madam Elliot. Uh, I don't know what to say after uh, previous speakers because they covered uh, all important issues uh, very well and the uh, definitions they made are uh, very fruitful and uh, very helpful. Uh, I agree with uh, President Ivanich who have said that uh, we are living uh, surrounded by many conflicts and uh, even conflicts that are in between uh, small countries can be solved only if big powers are having the same approach. Which means that uh, small countries in the current world are not able to solve their countries alone. And uh, this is bringing all, all of us in a very difficult situation, specifically because of uh, international development uh, regarding the position of the big power and the multilateral institutions. You know, uh, things are changeable. I agree with the previous speakers that, that, that said that uh, uh, we are living in an unpredictable world and that world is going to be even more unpredictable in the next few years, uh, maybe even months. Uh, and uh, we'll see what is going to be final outcome in uh, some uh, big powers regarding elections, for example, United States. And we'll see whether that big powers are going to have a more coherent foreign policy than before. Why I'm saying that? We have a Russia, we have a uh, China uh, in the region of Eurasia, we have European Union, and we have United States. United States foreign policy is not that coherent like it was. I mean, uh, only a few weeks ago, we've been witnessing uh, some uh, event in Washington about Kosovo, Serbia issue. And uh, that uh, event uh, brought to all of us uh, some very bizarre uh, decisions that uh, Serbia and Kosovo are going to uh, change the, the attitude uh, regarding uh, embassy of Israel in Tel Aviv. 
I don't know how issue of embassy in Tel Aviv and removing that embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem is connected with the conflict between uh, Pristina and Belgrade. But uh, this is outcome of foreign policy of United States. Uh, and also, uh, I can add to that that uh, we obliged ourselves to be more engaged in fighting for uh, human uh, rights for homosexuals in South Sudan and other countries. Uh, this is really bizarre. We agree with everyone who is uh, defending human rights elsewhere all around the world, especially for homosexuals also. But how that issue is connected with the conflict uh, between Belgrade and Pristina. And this is why uh, I have to mention this totally uncoherent position of the foreign policy of the United States in the current world, not only in Serbia, but elsewhere. So many things uh, depend on uh, individual interests uh, of people that are uh, sitting in the, in, the, in, the, in the White House today. And uh, this is something very, very dangerous from my point of view. Second, if you are mentioning uh, Russia, I totally agree with the previous speakers that are saying that Russia is not a uh, champion of democracy and that Russia with uh, its traditional position regarding foreign policy is uh, very often making many, many problems all around the world. Uh, but Russia as a big power has an interest to uh, penetrate into the uh, security system, economic system and, uh, and the uh, international arena, everywhere they have an interest. The problem is that Russia has an interest everywhere. And, the, and the President Putin is going to interfere in domestic relations, uh, relations like it was always. But I have to mention this is uh, happening also with the United States foreign policy in the current world. And this is a very dangerous situation. And we have a third player. This is China which is looking very stable today with the, with the statements of uh, President Xi Jinping. But uh, China is also uh, occupied by their own problems and challenging, for example, situation in Xinjiang with the Uyghuris and uh, other conflicts, for example, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, uh, but these three players are going to have, take uh, the main role in the Euro-Asian area. Uh, and I have a real concerns because we don't know what is going to be their reaction and their position in the next few months and day, few years. And this is why we are living in totally, totally unpredictable, unpredictable world. But we have to take into account also position not of the big powers, but some of the main players in the region. This is Turkey with uh, President Erdogan uh, uh, as an as a, as a undisputable leader, leader of Turkey nowadays, which has international ambitions. Uh, President Erdogan, who is connected with some international Muslim organizations totally, uh, is uh, bringing into the political arena some new style of Turkey, and this is concerning everyone today. This is Israel which has a big impact on the situation in the Middle East, but also on in the in, internet, internal policy in the United States. This is Iran, with a huge impact on some conflicts and the traditional uh, rivality, for example, with the Saudi Arabia and some other countries. Uh, and this is also India, which is mentioned by some of the previous speakers that is taking very important role, not only because of being involved in a traditional conflict on Kashmir with the Pakistan, but India is a, is a rising star. Huge country with a huge potential technological development. We have to take India into the account very seriously in, into the future. I'm reminding ourselves that the uh, role of China was under the, was something somehow underestimated uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, China was treated as a, as a big country, which is coming very slow, very slow, very slow. But nowadays, China is a, is a big power, uh, uh, economy number two, maybe number one in the next 10 years. Uh, inevitable regarding uh, strategical uh, issues, uh, for example, South China Sea. Uh, for example, issues of Central Asia, for example, issue of uh, Belt and Road strategy. Uh, for example, WTO organization and something like that. But what is going to be 
uh, role of India in next five and ten years, we have to take into the consideration very seriously because in because of India is preparing themselves for, for for taking big role and important role in international arena very very soon. We are living in in, in the area of Euro Asia. In Euro Asia, we have a, a presence of few military organizations. This is NATO, and this is CSTO. Uh, led by Russia, and uh, we have uh, also China as a big military power, and India, which is going to be even bigger in next only in next few years. This is Israel and Iran, and we have to be really concerned about future of Euro-Asia uh, very soon. What I have to mention, what what was uh, in the previous uh, sessions mentioned by President Yusupov that uh, we are living in the Balkans, but we have uh, so many irresponsible leaders on the Balkans. And in that respect, we cannot ignore possible military conflict in the Balkans, even though it looks much better today than only 10 years or 15 years ago. But uh, things are changeable. Things are changeable overnight. And uh, uh, specifically for the regions where we have uh, uh, a situation with unstable institutions. Balkans is a, is a su such a part of, of European Union. I hope, I hope that we can be member states of European Union as soon as possible. But I'm not sure that European Union is taking this really seriously into the account because of their domestic problems. For political leaders in European Union as are facing with their domestic problems. Enlargement fatigue is one of the main characteristics of domestic situation in European Union countries. If, for example, President Macron or Chancellor Merkel are going to say that Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Albania are going to become member states of European Union in the next two, three years, they are going to have uh, problems on the next elections. And they are always avoiding to say this clearly. They are not only avoiding to say this clearly, they are, are avoiding to behave in accordance with the debt standards and the debt strategical goals, uh, really. And I think that European Union uh, is uh, taking into account future membership of uh, Balkan countries in some asymptotic way. We are approaching, we are approaching, but we are not, <laughs> probably we are not going to reach that status, never. Uh, and this is problem for all of us. This is problem in terms of security for European Union because of Balkans, which is uh, significant gate for European Union, the region that can destabilize not only European Union, but global arena, that, uh, that is a historical fact that I have to mention. And uh, taking this into the account, even Europe is not looking very stable if we are uh, uh, thinking about Euro-Asia as a whole continent, as a whole uh, area in which we have to be focused very much. I would like to, uh, to summarize somehow. This is Balkans, which is not looking very stable today, but even though this is much better and much more secure area than others area in Eurasia. Uh, this is South Caucasus uh, with the conflict of, of uh, regarding uh, Georgia and Russia, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and nagorno karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. This is, I have to mention also Syria, which is very well, very much connected regarding conflicts potential with our Eurasian area, uh, in which we have a big competition between the United States, Russia, and some other players. This is also uh, Central Asia, which is looking much better than before, specifically because of new role of Uzbekistan which is developing very fast and which is taking very serious and very responsible position right now. I appreciate that very much. But uh, we have to take into account the fact that uh, we have a pot always potential conflict between Pakistan and India, and this is a big problem. And I have to mention China with the Uyghurian issue. This is, a, this is really very fragile situation in China. But Uyghur is, uh, I mean, the, the part of the, of the uh, Altai-speaking group of the people connected with the Turkey, connected with the Central Asia country. And we are living in the interconnected world. We are living in the small world, in fact, and we are depend on each other. 
I have real concerns about architecture of security in the future of Eurasia. I have real concerns about further developing in, in, in all other big, in all big players, for example, United States, we'll see what is going to be impact of presidential elections in United States with a huge impact even on Eurasia. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And you've uh, actually done my job for me because I think you really wrapped up um, the challenges that we all face um, in this region and the importance, I think, of countries like the US, Russia, and China, not, um, but looking for ways, we don't have to agree on everything, but ways that we can pay, play positive rather than negative role. And the, the fragility of, and we looked at um, how easy it is for countries like Armenia and Azerbaijan to have conflict. And, and I agree with you, I think, while I'm not a part of the European Union, I think it behooves the members of the European Union to embrace the countries of the Western Balkans so that they can be stronger and then look again across the Caspian and further. But anyway, I want to thank all of you today. I think um, I want to thank uh, NGIC because I think what we have highlighted today is the importance of organizations like mine, like Nizabi Ganjabi in bringing people together to try to make recommendations and solve these very uh, difficult problems that we're all facing. So thank you again for all of your time and thank you Ravshan for putting this panel uh, together.